the states and where they were. It's not about architectural styles or anything like that. Um, we're going to cover the Delaware River front estates in Northeast Philadelphia. And Northeast Philadelphia is defined as that part of the city above the Taconi Frankfurt Creek. Um, you can see uh, right between the H and the I there on Philadelphia, the Taconi Frankfurt Creek. It's called the Taconi or sometimes called Tuckany Creek at its western part. And then as it approaches the neighborhood of Frankfurt, it, the name changes to Frankfurt Creek, but it's all the same body of water. Uh, and that empties into the Delaware. Uh, in the, and that's the lower part of the Northeast. And then the, uh, as I said earlier, the northern boundary of uh, Philadelphia with Bucks County is the Poquessing Creek. And then the Northeast is actually bisected by the Pennypack Creek right down the middle. So that's the area we're going to cover. Uh, here's like an aerial view, the Frankfurt Creek on the bottom, the Poquessing Creek on the top. Uh, and it's an area of about eight miles. So we're going to go upstream, up river from Frankfurt area up, uh, Frankfurt Creek up to Poquessing Creek. And these are the neighborhoods, the riverfront neighborhoods uh, that we're going to examine. Frankfurt, Wissanoming, Taconi, Holmesburg, and Tarsdale. We're going to make a very, very brief uh, excursion into Bucks County just for one quick note. Um, but uh, otherwise, this whole presentation is focused on the area within the city limits. And we're going to start in Frankfurt. And there's three historic estates uh, that we're going to look at in Frankfurt, Chalkley Hall, Walm Grove, and Port Royal. Um, these um, were owned by wealthy Quaker, well, uh, Walden and, and Chalkley Hall were Quakers. I don't think Port Royal was. Uh, wealthy Quaker merchants. And when we say merchants, uh, we don't mean like shopkeepers. We're talking about overseas traders who were dealing with, you know, major goods, shipping and trading overseas. So these were wealthy uh, businessmen and merchants. And the first um, and one of the oldest estates in the Northeast, again, not there anymore, is Chalkley Hall. Um, it was built around 1723, although there's some question as to whether that date might be later, uh, by Thomas Chalkley and then enlarged in 1775 about uh, by his son-in-law, Abel James. Uh, Ch Thomas Chalkley was a noted Quaker missionary and a minister. He, you know, proselytized the Quaker faith and but he was a mariner he he captained ships and a merchant he did a lot of trading mainly in the caribbean and in fact he died in the caribbean in 1741 but he also kept a journal um which we'll talk about in a minute but here are some views of chalkley hall which was you know a beautiful gorgeous estate um some more views of it and uh Thomas Chalkley, as I said, he kept this journal and then it was published after his death. The first printing uh, was by Benjamin Franklin and his partner, David Hall. And um, then it was republished um, a number of times. So the first published in 1749, a few years after uh, Chalkley's death. And then it was republished a number of times. This is an 1850 publication. Um, from London. So Thomas Chalkley was a pretty noted guy in the sort of in the Quaker community. Um, and his house, Chalkley Hall, was sort of a, an important landmark. Uh, the great Quaker poet John Greenleaf Whittier uh, visited Chalkley Hall in the uh, 1830s and he wrote this poem. Uh, these are some excerpts from it. It's not, it's a, a lengthy poem, but he, he talks about, you know, here from his voyages on the stormy seas, you know, Thomas Chalkley came home to greet his children and bless his Lord and all that. Um, and at the very end of the poem, uh, which I included at the bottom there, uh, Whittier says, to me, this is holy ground. You know, Chalkley Hall is like sacred ground. Um, but alas, uh, uh, not um, development encroached upon Chalkley Hall as it did this whole area that we're going to talk about in, in Frankfurt, the, the riverfront part of Frankfurt. 
um, by you know, in the late 1800s and into the early 1900s, uh, this area became highly industrialized. And so you can see this big plant, you know, this big factory right up against Chalkley Hall, which by this point is no longer occupied. And it's decaying and uh, vacant. And um, there were efforts to save it. Um, a number of students from the Philadelphia Institute of Design for Women made a number of measured drawings and came up with a restoration plan for the main stair hall of Chalkley Hall. Uh, the Historical American Building Survey, HABS, uh, did detailed drawings and took photographs in the 1930s. Um, Frances Wister, who's like, kind of like the godmother of historic preservation in Philadelphia, uh, she's the uh, founder of the uh, Society for the Preservation of Landmarks, um, she tried to save uh, Ch Chalkley Hall. And um, I'm going to highlight, whoops, shoot. Um, yeah, there it is. Um, here it is. Uh, she has this quote, if the work, it, I think they were resigned to the fact that the building was going to get demolished, but she was saying, well, maybe we can take the stones apart without destroying them and then put the building together elsewhere. Um, alas, that didn't happen. And Chalkley Hall was demolished in 1955. Now, remnants of it still survive. Uh, in the Metropolitan Museum in New York City, the doorway, so if you go back, if I go back a slide, you see that doorway there? Well, that's now in the Metropolitan Museum, Gallery 756, you can go see it. Um, these statues uh, that sat at the entrance here and here, um, they uh, are now in the garden of the Historical Society of Frankfurt. And that's the society and the garden is that gated area off to the right there. So you can, there are these remnants of Chalkley Hall around. Now, in addition to his other notable activities, uh, Thomas Chalkley was the great grandfather of Betsy Ross. And this is the Betsy Ross Bridge on the bridge on the left, uh, which opened in 1976, uh, looking into New Jersey, which is the upper part of this photo. And this is looking into Philadelphia. Um, and where that star is, is more or less where Chalkley Hall was. So as you're getting off the Betsy Ross Bridge, you know, as you get off the off ramp, uh, you're basically ending up where Betsy Ross's great grandfather lived, which is kind of interesting. The next place we're going to do is Walm Grove. Um, Here's a watercolor of it from 1886. Robert Walm was another wealthy Quaker merchant. The Walms were a wealthy you know, merchant family and descendant from some, the, some of the earliest settlers of, um, of Philadelphia with William Penn. Uh, so Robert Walm built Walm Grove uh, around 1742. And here are some views of it. Um, I'm hearing, Fred, I'm hearing some feedback. Is somebody unmuted? Uh, um, anyway, uh, here is uh, another view. And this, I think this painting is from that photograph, perhaps. Um, and a descendant of Robert Wong, Joseph Wong Ryers, built Burholm, also known as the Ryers Mansion, in 1859. Now, this is not a riverfront estate. This is in the Fox Chase Burholm area, long, long, far away from the river, but still in Northeast Philadelphia. This is a really fascinating museum. I highly re recommend you uh, visit it. Um, but in that museum and historic house uh, is a painting of the ancestral home, Walm Grove, which is on display, and it was done by a Ryer's cousin in 1875. So you can see that painting there um, at the Ryer's Mansion, Ryer's Museum. And the mantle pieces, the mantles from Walm Grove are at the Historical Society of Frankfurt also. As you, uh, here's some more recent photos. As you walk in the building, the main entrance, there's rooms on, on to your left and to your right, and that's where these uh, mantles are. 
And then the last uh, place in Frankfurt that we're going to look at is Port Royal, which survives in a most unique way. Um, the, not the building itself, but so it was built in 1761 by another Philadelphia merchant and ship owner, Edward Stiles. Uh, here's some views of it. That's one of the clearest photographs. Now, um, here's an account. Elizabeth Drinker, a uh, Quaker woman who lived in the area, kept a diary for like 50 years, one of the great diaries of colonial women of, uh, of America. And the background to this diary entry of hers is that the British, during the Revolutionary War, the British occupied Philadelphia from the fall of 1777 to the spring of 1778. And uh, the British did a lot of plundering uh, while they were in this area, and they plundered um, Port Royal. And here's a diary entry of Elizabeth Drinker, our neighbor Stiles, sent over this morning to borrow, borrow our good horse, and we lent him to her to go to Frankfurt. So the village of Frankfurt was like, you know, to, nearby. She returned in evening on foot, having lost her chaise and our horse. They were taken from her by the English light horse, just as she was getting in the chaise at their place. They have been plundered at their country house lately of all the valuable furniture, provisions, coach, chariot, horses, eight or 10 Negroes, etc., etc., to a great amount. Now, of course, this speaks to the tenor of the times that she would list eight or 10 Negroes, which were most likely enslaved, uh, along with the furniture and the, and the coaches and the horses and all, which, you know, just the, the horrible practice of slavery, which was a fact of life at that time. And another fact of life um, were, at that time, most of the recorded record of all these individuals were the white men. The, you know, the, the ones who were wealthy, who owned the businesses and own these properties. Um, we don't know as much about the women, the wives, the daughters, the servants, the enslaved African-Americans. There are fascinating stories to be told, to drill down uh, with these estates. Um, it's not possible to do that in this presentation because we're kind of quickly going through uh, all of these uh, estates. So we can't really do a deep dive into any one of them. This is just a real quick review of them. But just so that it's clear that there are really complex and interesting stories uh, to be told about all these estates beyond just like who owned them and who built them. So. Now, just like um, uh, Chalkley Hall and Walnut Grove, uh, Port Royal, you know, was the victim of industrialization and development all around it. So, you know, here's a late 1920s photograph, um, you know, of the building and it's, it's in disrepair. And, you know, it had been abandoned. Um, it had come into the Lucans family, uh, but nobody wanted it. They couldn't give it away. Um, and then into the picture comes Henry Francis DuPont. Uh, who is an heir to the DuPont fortune. He lives outside of Wilmington, Delaware, and he's a major collector of early American fine and decorative arts. And he has a friend, J.A. Lloyd Hyde, who's a New York City antiques dealer and who also collects historic sites and materials. And J.A. Lloyd Hyde is taking the train often from New York to Wilmington to visit with uh, Henry Francis. And Port Royal is right near the railroad tracks. And so um, Hyde notices this once grand, now decaying estate, and he alerts DuPont. And to make a long story short, DuPont purchases Port Royal in 1928, has these very detailed drawings made, strips it of all its doors, windows, you know, stairways, mantles, paneling, everything, because it's going to be destroyed. This, there's no stopping that. So he strips it all. And this is what it looks like after it's been stripped. Um, and he has this home outside of Wilmington and he's collecting all these things, not just the Port Royal things, but things from other estates that he's collected as well. And he decides to build a new wing onto his house to house all these things. And that's the genesis of the Winterthur Museum, which is one of the greatest 
you know, museums of fine and decorative, early American decorative and fine arts, you know, in the, in the world. Um, and it really kind of started with Port Royal and these other estates. Um, the, the wing was at, in the beginning, you know, kind of modest and small, and then it got added to and enlarged tremendously over the years. So now it's like nothing like it was originally. But when you go to Port, uh, when you go to Winterthur, there's the Port Royal Parlor. This is all the Port Royal woodwork and paneling and everything. Uh, here's another uh, view of it. Here's the Port Royal entrance with the doorway of Port Royal. Another view of it. And then um, there's an article published um, on, and this is the, um, on the Port Royal entrance. Well, there was an article published on the early history of Port Royal and, um, and talking about how, uh, or, I'm sorry, the early history of Winterthur, talking about how it's very much based on Port Royal. And so this doorway uh, pictured in the article, you know, is the same doorway uh, that was taken from Port Royal. And here it is on Winterthur, the original wing, which was then greatly expanded over the years. So that's it for the Frankfurt mansions. There, you know, remnants of them exist uh, here and there, but the buildings themselves are long gone. Uh, we move up to the next neighborhood, Riverfront neighborhood up north, and that's Wissanoming. And that's the name of the estate of Matthias Baldwin, who's a, one of the great industrialists of Philadelphia history. Uh, he named his estate Wissanoming, and that's how the neighborhood got its name. Uh, he was a fascinating character. Um, he began his <clears throat> career actually as an apprentice to a jeweler in Frankfurt. But he was a brilliant inventor and engineer, and he eventually became this major industrialist and philanthropist. He built one of the first railways in America, the first railroad in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, which was the uh, Philadelphia Germantown Norristown Railroad. And then he founded Baldwin Locomotive Works, which eventually becomes the largest locomotive manufacturer in the world. And this is an aerial view of the Baldwin Locomotive Works, which is more or less around where <clears throat> Broad and Spring Garden Streets uh, are in, you know, the Spring Garden part of, of the center city. Um, it was a massive, massive enterprise. Uh, at its height, he had over 18,000 workers, the largest industry, private industry in Philadelphia history by far. But um, Wissanoming was his country estate, and this is where uh, he would spend some time, and this is where he died in 1866. 20 some years later, it's acquired, the uh, estate is acquired by the old ladies home of Philadelphia. And they build some wings on to house uh, elderly women. And that's how a lot of people remember it. I think it lasted into the 50s or 60s as, as that. Um, and these are some views of it from postcards and um, from other sources. And uh, here's some interior views of it. And this is where it was located. Um, if you know the area, this is State Road here, and this is Comley Road here, and it's just a little uh, north of the Frankfurt Arsenal, which would be just to the left. Um, this is what that site looks like today. Again, like all these sites along here, it became highly industrialized uh, and was no longer. A, so these, all these guys were building these states because they, they, it was this beautiful bucolic natural wooded area along the river and of course all of those qualities uh, got washed away with with the industrialization and development so you know the estates had didn't have any appeal anymore and so they were all eventually demolished um the next neighborhood up is Taconi, and we're going to look at a few estates here now when you think of Taconi. Um, you think of, or most people think uh, of the riverfront of Taconi, you think of the Diston Sawworks. Uh, Henry Diston established 
his saw works in Tacconi in the 1870s, beginning in the 1870s. He had a saw manufacturing plant in Northern Liberties and he needed, he had outgrown it, he needed more space. So he found this, you know, open space, lots of land along the river uh, in Tacconi. Uh, and like Baldwin, this becomes a massive enterprise, some 3,500 employees, 59 buildings, over 50 acres. Uh, but that's starting in the 1870s. Before that, um, you know, Tacconi was largely undeveloped and was kind of a, a nice bucolic area and actually became a sort of a resort. So we're going to look at um, three estates in Tacconi, Lardner, Estate, Magnolia, and Gatsmer's Cottage. And I, and I want to give a shout out to two people who have done a lot of research on all this. Uh, and they're both board members of our Friends of Northeast Philadelphia History. And that's one is Charlie McCluskey, who did a book a number of years ago on Tacconi in the era of William Gatsmer, who we're going to talk about in a minute. But that's the era before distant. So this is like the 1840s and 50s and 60s. Um, and then uh, we purchased, the Friends of Northeast Philadelphia History purchased a really important manuscript collection that, that came available a couple of years ago. Um, these papers, letters, diaries, journals, other th deeds and other uh, records of this uh, set of interrelated families who all lived in this Taconi area uh, back in the colonial and 19th century. And um, Charlie went through, there was almost 400 documents. Charlie went through and inventoried them and did this very descriptive inventory and transcribed most of these documents. And then we published those descriptive inventories and transcriptions uh, in 2019. That's that book on the left. So Charlie has written two books uh, on this Taconi area. He's, he's very knowledgeable about it. And then the other person who's done a lot is my wife, Patty, uh, who's done a lot of research on both Taconi uh, and then in the Tarsdale area. And Charlie McCluskey also did a lot of work on Tarsdale. So when we get to Tarsdale, a lot of my presentation will be based on their research, as is this presentation on the Taconi area. So both of them have done a tremendous amount of, of, of research and sort of provided the raw materials that I'm using for my talk. So one of the earliest estates in the Taconi area is the Lardner Mansion known as Somerset. Um, and here's some, another view of it. Um, and it was built by Linford Lardner, uh, who was born and raised in England, but his sister married Richard Penn, the son of William Penn, you know, I didn't really talk about that, but many people might know. Philadelphia was founded by William Penn in 1682. And, you know, he was the, the founder of the city of the, of the colony of Pennsylvania, later the state of Pennsylvania. And they were the colonial rulers, he and his sons and grandsons. So they were the elite of, of Philadelphia. And Linford Lardner's sister married a, a son of William Penn. So, so Lardner kind of married into wealth and influence. And he had a number of important positions in the colonial government. And his family lived at this Somerset estate for uh, around 150 years. Um, here's another view of it uh, from a painting. Um, and here's a photo of it from the river. Now, uh, Somerset was located to today, uh, kind of right at the foot of the Taconi Palmyra Bridge. That bridge was built in 1929. Um, around 1890, the Lardner Point Pumping Station, it's a, you know, pumping water for the city of Philadelphia. The, they, the city built this pumping station right there at what's called Lardner's Point. And that's around the time we think that uh, Somerset was demolished was when this pumping station was built. And then, you know, 40 years later or so, the Taconi Bridge was built right at that same spot. But where the Lardner estate, Somerset was, is now a park a city park called Lardner's Point Park. 
Um, kind of next door to Lardner's estate is Magnolia Grove. It's listed on this map as Magnolia Hill, which was the property of the Gal Gordon and Salter family. Uh, Thomas Gordon was a wealthy Philadelphia merchant, like a lot of these guys. You know, they had they were they had they were wealthy, and they had city townhouses, and then they had their country estates. Uh, so that's Thomas Gordon on the far left. But standing in the rear is his daughter, Elizabeth. She married a guy named John Salter. They got married at Magnolia Grove uh, in 1774, and then they purchased the property from the family in 1780. Their daughter, Frances, popularly known as Fanny, later wrote um, some well-known reminiscences of life at Magnolia Grove. I want to talk about that in, in a minute. But here are... Um, some views of Magnolia Grove, which was pretty right on the river, actually. Now, there's so in this one, you don't see the railroad. In this one, you see the railroad tracks. Uh, these are not the main railroad tracks. Um, so, so here's uh, Magnolia Grove, and here's this Kensington to Coney rail line, which was a smaller line for, for industry. Uh, up here is the main uh, rail line. It was the Philadelphia Trenton Railroad, later the Pennsylvania Railroad, and later SEPTA and Amtrak. I mean, those tracks are still there. But the, the, the train tracks in front of uh, Magnolia Grove were a smaller rail line. And then here's a view, uh, aerial view of um, the Tacony Palmyra Ferry. So Remember I said that Tacony Palmyra Bridge was built in 1929. Well, prior to that, there was a ferry that went back and forth between Tacony and Palmyra, New Jersey. And here's a, a view of the ferry. Um, and then here you can see the cars, you know, lining up to get on the ferry. Well, this is right where the bridge was built. And this is an aerial view taken before um, the bridge was built. And here's that Lardner's Point pumping station. Um, and here's a kind of a, a close-up of that 1927 photo of Magnolia Grove uh, shortly before it was demolished for the building of the bridge. But um, the bridge, you know, the, the entrance and all is right here and then the bridge across the river. So Somerset and Magnolia uh, are, are now, were on either side of what later became the Tacony Palmyra Bridge there right on the river. Now, here's what's interesting is um, I mentioned Fanny Salter. She was a daughter of the Salters uh, who lived at Magnolia Grove. She lived from 1790 to 1880. And in the mid-1800s, she begins to write a series of letters to her niece in which she reminisces, reminisces about life at Magnolia in the colonial period and after. Now, Fanny did not live in the colonial period. She was born in 1790, but the family had passed down lots of stories, and she was relaying these family lore, these family stories, to her niece. So she's relaying life in colonial era to Coney uh, as told to her, but then she goes on to talk about life you know, during her time too, the 1790s and the early 1800s. So in 1916, um, the family, members of the family published excerpts of these letters in the Pennsylvania Magazine of History and Biography, which is published by the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. And it's called Fanny Salter's Reminiscences of Colonial Days in Philadelphia. So this is the collection, these letters ended up being the collection that we, the Friends of Northeast Philadelphia History, purchased a few years ago. They became available through a manu rare book and manuscript dealer, and we purchased them because they're really important uh, sources on colonial and early 19th century uh, Tacony in that whole area. And that's this is where I mentioned uh, Charlie McCluskey um, transcribed a lot of these letters and did a detailed inventory of the collection. And what he found was in the published versions, the versions that were published in 1916, a lot of things were left out. And plus there's a lot of things were added in that there's no evidence of in the letters. So, uh, but one of the things uh, that was left out that Fanny Salter wrote in the 1800s that didn't get published in, in the 19 teens is that some of the family members were British sympathizers 
during the Revolutionary War. So the family obviously didn't want that to be known when they had these letters published in 1916, so they sort of left that out. But our version of these transcribed letters, this book, which you can buy, whoops, sorry. Uh, and again, if you go to that Facebook page I mentioned earlier where it says shop now, and you click on that button, you can either make a donation or you can, there's all our books that we publish are listed for sale. So you can buy this book, but this has the full unexpurgated transcriptions of these letters, you know, with nothing left out. Uh, and Charlie did a magnificent job on, um, on, on that book. So that's one of our offerings. Uh, the next place uh, we're gonna talk about in Chaconi is Gatchmer's Cottage. Uh, this is his William Gatzmer's uh, cottage right on the Delo or Delaware, built in the mid 1840s, designed by this uh, noted local architect, Joseph Hoxie. Uh, William Gatzmer was involved in the railroads. He came to Philadelphia in 1835 as an agent for the Camden Amboy Railroad, and then uh, later secured a charter for the Philadelphia Trenton Railroad in 1846. And then uh, he developed Taconi as a resort and depot for this railroad for passengers between New York and Philadelphia. And what happened is um, the railroad was supposed to go, you know, all the way from Trenton right into Philadelphia. And in the 1840s, railroads were dangerous, dirty, smelly, noisy. Uh, the sparks caused fires, they belched smoke, they went at really high speeds through neighborhoods. They were really, really a nuisance. And the people of Kensington uh, were pro protested the um, laying out of the railroad through their neighborhood. And so the, the railroad, and they were successful, there were actually riots uh, to uh, prevent this, and they were successful in preventing the railroad from going through their neighborhood into the city. A line did go deep into Northern Liberties, but it was more like a, 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 for um, cargo and stuff. But for the passengers, if you were a, you know, a passenger going from New York to Philadelphia or vice versa, what you did is the terminus was in Taconi of the railroad, the New York, Philadelphia, New York Railroad. You took the train to Taconi, got off, took a ferry from Taconi into the city and vice versa. If you were going from the city to New York, you take a ferry to Taconi, get off, then take the train from there. So as a result of this, Taconi sort of becomes a major depot and a bit of a resort. And you can see these hotels here, the Washington Park Hotel, and the Duffield Hotel. Uh, and Gatzmer, you know, he lived right there, like he was running this whole thing, and he lived right there. And this was, of course, the depot. So Taconi becomes this uh, major transportation hub and sort of resort area. This is in the 40s, 50s, 60s, right, before Henry Diston arrives and starts industrializing the whole area. And again, here's a here's a, a picture of Gatzmer's cottage, and you see this very idyllic scene along the river, very peaceful and tranquil and natural. And and then, you know, 30 years later, this would be factories belching smoke and all that. Here's a uh, photograph. This is the only known photograph of uh, Gatzmer's cottage with William Gatzmer in the center. Now, from Taconi, we move up to Holmesburg. And we're going to look at um, three estates in Holmesburg, Springbrook, Linfield, and Riverdale. So Springbrook uh, was owned by a man named Caleb Cope. Um, here it is in an 1850 map, but um, in the 18, what was it? Uh, 1860s, yeah. So here, 1860s, it was purchased by Edwin Forrest and it becomes known as the Edwin Forrest home eventually. But Edwin Forrest was this renowned actor. He was the most famous actor of the 19th century, American actor. And he's a Philadelphia native. Uh, and uh, the Forrest Theater is in Philadelphia is named after him. But he purchases this Springbrook estate, Caleb Cope, 
1865. He does not ever live there. He, his home is on North Broad Street in Philadelphia. But he provides in his will that upon his death, it become a home for aged actors. So he dies in 1872. Four years later, the Forest Home opens and it operates in Holmesburg until 1927. So here's an 1876 atlas uh, showing uh, the Edwin Forest estate. It's 100 acres. Um, for your bearings, this is Frankfurt Avenue, then known as Bristol Pike, and this is Cotman Avenue, then known as Township Line Road. Um, here's another kind of view. So the estate wasn't right on the river. Here's the river here. There was the railroad in between, and but it, you could see the river from um, the forest home. Uh, and the forest, the track went, you know, all the way, like for quite a ways, it was a very large uh, estate. And then it got developed in the 18, in the 1920s. Uh, but here's some views of the Edwin Forest home. I'm drawing. And here's an article uh, showing some of the retired actors and actresses living there. Uh, what's interesting is, um, as stipulated in Forrest Will, uh, the, the people who live there had to put on performances for the community on certain days on Shakespeare. I forget, was it Forrest's birthday and Shakespeare's birthday? Or I, I forget what the dates were. But so uh, Holmesburg had this kind of lively theater scene going because of these retired actors and actresses that live there and, and performed occasionally. Uh, here's an interior view of the Forest home and this statue here is of Edward Forrest in one of, it, uh, of his uh, Shakespearean roles and that statue is now in the Walnut Street Theater in downtown. And you might ask, why isn't the Edwin Forrest statue in the Edwin Forrest Theater? And the reason is the Edwin Forrest Theater, uh, the Forrest Theater, was built years after Forrest died. He never performed there. The Walnut Street Theater, which is the oldest theater in America, the oldest continuously operating theater opening in 1809, uh, Forrest played there many, many times. So it's much more appropriate that his statue be there. So that statue that you see at the Walnut Street Theater, if you go there, once was in the uh, Edwin Forrest home in, in Holmesburg. Uh, another estate, not too far from Springbrook, which was, or the, or which you know was the, became the Forest Home, was the estate of um, William Lardner, known as Linfield. Um, if you remember uh, Somerset, the estate in Taconi, uh, built by Linford Lardner. Well, this is his son William, uh, who had this um, place that he called Linfield um, in. Um, Holmesburg at present, what is now present day Ron Street and Tarsdale Avenue. Uh, so Linford Lardner's son, John Lardner, inherited Somerset, the main estate in Taconi, and the other son, one of his other sons, built this estate called Linfield. Um, and it, a few, several years ago, we purchased, again, the Friends of Northeast Philadelphia, purchased William Lardner's account book and farm journal uh, which is here uh, going from 1796 until his death in 1827, a very detailed uh, account book showing, you know, all his purchases and expenses and whatnot. Um, so someday we'll hopefully transcribe that and publish that as well, because that's a really rich resource also. And then the last estate in Holmesburg uh, we're going to talk about is Riverdale, which really is some people would consider it Tarsdale as opposed to Holmesburg, uh, but it's kind of on the border of the both of them. Uh, we're going to talk about this estate here, but over here you'll see 11 Mile Lane, um, which is so called because it's 11 miles from the center of Philadelphia. And 11 Mile Lane later, later became Linden Avenue. And Linden Avenue is pretty much considered the dividing line between the neighborhood of Tarsdale and the neighborhood of Holmesburg. So um, this, this Riverdale estate kind of straddles. And also of note here, Alex Brown's estate, or Alexander Brown's estate. Uh, we're not going to talk about that, 
but um, he was a major landowner and his son owned a major estate in Tarsdale that we're going to talk about it in, in a few mm -hmm. minutes. Mm -hmm. So um, Joseph Harrison purchases Riverdale in 1853 and he's a major inventor and engineer like Matthias Baldwin. And in fact, he sold a patent for a locomotive stabilizer to Baldwin. And that, that patent of that stabilizer actually was one of the things that allowed uh, Baldwin to become extremely successful. Um, so um, these guys were you know, similar in that they were inventors and engineers and businessmen. Uh, the, Harrison became phenomenally wealthy going to Russia with some partners in the 1840s in building a huge railroad network for the czar of Russia. And then he comes back in 1850. He's extremely wealthy. Uh, he becomes an art collector and a writer. And uh, he has a very large and elaborate mansion on Rittenhouse Square, uh, pictured here. And then he built, um, he, well, he purchased Riverdale and built a Russian style mansion, because he had been in Russia with an onion dome. And there you see it at the bottom. I'll show you some more pictures in a minute. Um, so very, very unusual architecture for Philadelphia, you know, in the mid 1800s, this sort of Russian style building with an onion dome. The other thing is he took, uh, you know, he, he was an engineer and uh, he, he undertook this massing, massive dredging operation on the riverfront in front of uh, his home, Riverdale. Uh, we wanted to create these wharves and levees and stuff. Um, and a legend developed that he was dredging up these noxious materials that you know, made him sick and caused his death and caused the death of his children. Well, that's not true. That's absolute f falsehood. My wife did a lot of research on this, Patty, and found that he died of a whole other disease. And his children never lived there or only lived there briefly and all lived into old age. So they never even died there. But for some reason, this um, legend took hold and the estate became known as Harrison's Folly. Um, and here are some views of it. You can see that uh, onion dome very clearly. The next view is, I think, looking from the onion dome past this cupola here on the house. Uh, so this would be looking uh, south, uh, deeper into Holmesburg with the river on your left. And then he dies in the 1870s. And so now it's the estate. Uh, here you can see the, uh, the, the Joseph Harrison estate, uh, 300 and some acres. And this is, this is right on, remember I mentioned the Pennypack Creek, which sort of bisects the Northeast. So this was right on, on the Pennypack Creek and the Delaware River. Now, after Harrison's death, his widow rents that riverfront property to the prison farm. Uh, and the, 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 the House of Correction and the Holmesburg Prison are nearby. And so they're using it to farm for the, you know, for the prisoners. Uh, in the 1890s, the city seizes it by eminent domain, they want to build a water treatment plant. This is around the time, you know, these waterborne diseases are ravaging the city and the city realizes that it needs to be much better at purifying its water and having a safe water supply. So they want to build this big water treatment plant and they seize that property by eminent domain. Harrison's widow sues, there's this long legal battle uh, she eventually receives restitution, but the city builds this water treatment plant there from 1900 to 1905. And so here are these um, photographs of the construction of that treatment plant. And you can see the Onion Dome and the, and the Riverdale estate there on the left on the river. Some more views, the same thing. It was a huge project. And of course, the Tarsdale treatment plant is still there. Some more views of the of the estate and the construction of the water treatment plant. And so this is the Tarzan water treatment plant today. Um, and here it is at the bottom here, right along the river, taking up this big chunk of land. Um, 
So that takes us into Tarsdale proper. And we're going to look at a number of the states in Tarsdale, very interesting history. Um, one of the earliest, probably the earliest um, estate uh, in Tarsdale is called the Bakehouse, which you see here, uh, which came into the Morgan family. But before that, in 1735, Evan Thomas, who's a Quaker miller, he purchases a large tract of land on the Delaware River right below the Poquessing Creek. So uh, here in this map, this is the Poquessing Creek, the northern border of Philadelphia and the Delaware River, and here's where the bakehouse is. Um, so Thomas builds a large bake oven on the property and sells bread and biscuit to the ships on the Delaware. And there's this wharf, which we're not sure if it was natural or man-made, but you can see it here in a modern photo, and you can see it here in this 1840s map. Uh, but the river is very deep right up to this wharf, so the ships could come right up close. So it made for easy access and, uh, you know, uh, allowed Thomas to have a, a successful, big, large, very large bakery business. So he dies, Evan Thomas, and the property is divided between his two sons. Evan, the son, gets the bakehouse and property itself and continues the bakery. And there's a tradition that he provided bread to Washington's troops during the Revolutionary War. Uh, as I was mentioning, the British were occupied Philadelphia during the Revolutionary War. So they were down in the city, but Washington's troops were up in the northern north of the city along the Delaware. And you remember they did the, they crossed the Delaware Washington's crossing on Christmas Eve and the Battle of Trenton and all that. So his troops were stationed nearby. So it's very possible uh, that Thomas did because he had a very large big operation. On the other hand, he was a Quaker and may not have wanted to uh, do business with an army. So who knows? But uh, in 1822, George Washington Morgan acquires the property, and he's the son of a Revolutionary War general, and that general actually was a good friend of George Washington, and he, and he named his son George Washington Morgan. So the son gets the property in 1822. He enlarges the home, which we're now going to call Bakehouse One, because there's going to be three bakehouses, and he removes the bake ovens. Uh, the property remains in the Morgan family in various descendants for 150 some years. Um, the descendants inherit the land, they purchase adjoining properties, other people marry into the family. So Morgan is the one who sort of is the source of all of these Tarsdale properties that we're going to examine uh, ba basically through his descendants and their married you know, partners. Um, George Washington Morgan is buried at All Saints Episcopal Cemetery, which is on Frankfurt Avenue in Tarsdale. Many of the people we're going to talk about here are buried in this historic cemetery. Um, the, you know, the Episcopal Church was the church for the wealthy landowners and business people. So a lot of them are buried in this cemetery nearby. So here's a painting, an 1846 painting of the Bakehouse property, which we're calling Bakehouse One. Uh, in 1850, that we see this map, and the Bakehouse is now here. Um, one of Morgan's daughters married a guy named Tessier, or Tessier, I don't know how you pronounce it, and they took over the Bakehouse. Meanwhile, another branch of the family built, oops, built um, Vancouver, uh, a, a, an estate called Vancouver. So this is all sort of Morgan property here, and but a, a hotel and ferry, Risden's Hotel and Ferry, had been here for a long time too. So that's what's here uh, in 1850. And you'll notice here at the confluence of the Poquessing Creek and the Delaware River, there's nothing right there. But that all changes in 1850. Charles McAllister uh, buys that property. He's a very wealthy fin financier and diplomat and, you know, confidant of presidents. He purchases this 84 acre tract right at where the creek and the river meet. And he builds a villa right at the point and he calls it Glen Gary. Uh, he's of Scottish descent. So he names it after one of his Scottish ancestral um, homes and, uh, you know, um, ancestral lands. So here's a view of Glengarry uh, from the 1870s. Now, I mentioned earlier, I'm going to uh, make a quick detour into Bucks County for a minute. 
uh, to mention, because this presentation is all about the Philadelphia estates. And once we get to the Boquessing Creek there, you know, that's the end of Philadelphia. But about a mile, mile and a half up the road or up river are, uh, well, is the Andalusia estate, which was the estate of Nicholas Biddle. Well, the Biddle family, he married into the Craig family, which built it. But uh, Nicholas Biddle was the president of the Second Bank of the United States, the central bank at the time. And then next door to that was an estate called Devon, which is actually earlier, uh, the estate of Alexander Dallas, who was the U.S. Secretary of the Treasury in the early 1800s. And I point all this out because um, there's a precedent for um, Charles McAllister settling here in around 1850 because all these banking magnets were, were building, had built these major estates very nearby. These were just up the river in the, in the Bucks County. Um, you know, Nicholas Biddle was a major banker. Alexander Dallas was the Secretary of Treasury. So that may have drawn um, McAllister to this area. Who knows? But he had a lot of, you know, compatriots in the fi major finance business as neighbors. So uh, he he names his house Glengarry, but he names the larger property Tarsdale with an I after his family's ancestral Scottish homeland. And then he begins to divide this property that he owns and sells lots to this wealthy class who build these riverfront country estates. And this is the beginning of Tarsdale as a distinct community. The, the spelling changes from an I to an E somewhere along the line. But Tarsdale really didn't exist until McAllister came and began to develop it. And so you really, there is no Tarsdale, quote unquote, until the 1850s. Um, and here's an 1876 map. And by this time, uh, here's McAllister, uh, his, he was dead. This is his estate, here's the Boquessing, and here's the river. But you can see all these uh, uh, estates uh, along the river like 30 years later. And uh, co contrast that to, you know, when we first looked at this area in 1842, 1843, there was just the Bakehouse, the Mor Morgan property, and the Robin Hood Dell Hotel, uh, Robin Hood Hotel, which, uh, becomes known as Risden's Ferry. So from that to this is what happened as a result of Charles McAllister's development. And we're going to look at all these estates, there's like six or seven of them, in Tarsdale, all built in the late 19th century, some in the, some in the early 20th. And we're just going to go like left to right, south to north. And we're going to start with the Bakehouse property, which in this 1876 map is owned by Mary Fisher. So the Bakehouse <clears throat> property uh, descends into the ownership of James and Mary Fisher. Mary is a granddaughter of that George Morgan who, you know, first developed this area or first bought the Bakehouse. The Bakehouse one that pictured there at the bottom burns down in 1865. Here's an article in the New York Times from December of 1865, destruction of an historical relic. The old bakehouse on the Delaware is burned. The Fishers build a new mansion, and we're going to call that Bakehouse Two. And this is Bakehouse Two, much more substantial. Of course, they're very wealthy. Um, here's another image of it, and yet another image of it. Um, and now we're going to jump ahead chronologically for um, continuity of story, because there's a Bakehouse 3 built in 1940. Um, Walter Massey Phillips is a descendant of the Morgan family, and he inherits the Bakehouse property. And it's this huge old, you know, property, very difficult to maintain, and he doesn't even live there anymore. Uh, so he had it demolished. And he had these noted architects of the time, Edmund Bacon, the famous Edmund Bacon, and Oscar Stoneroff, who's also, uh, these are modern architects of the mid 20th century. They built Bakehouse 3 in 1940 using stones from Bakehouse 2. So here's Bakehouse 3, still there. And jumping ahead a little further, just for the story, this whole area in the 1970s gets developed into two major condominium 
uh, developments, Dell Air Landing and Baker's Bay. <clears throat> the Bakehouse 3 is the administrative offices and the clubhouse for Dell Air Landing. Uh, my mother lived in Dell Air Landing for a number of years, and I would take her down here from time to time. She used to spend a lot of time here, you know, playing cards and socializing and whatnot. So there were three bakehouses, one, two, and three, uh, 18th century, 19th century, and 20th century. Now, another um, <clears throat> relic uh, from the bakehouse was the Del Air Landing, again, is this uh, condominium community. The maintenance workers' home is, uh, was built as a stable by the Fishers, who owned the bakehouse property in the mid-1800s, and they built it with stones from the original 18th century bake ovens. So this is still there. Um, it's kind of a nondescript property now, but it's built with stones from those early bake ovens. The next property up from the bakehouse is La Carolinita, built by William Hood Stewart. Um, here's a view of it. William Hood Stewart, uh, many of these, several of these uh, people along the river were involved in the sugar trade. They were very wealthy. They had plantations in the Caribbean. Uh, so William Hood Stewart marries the granddaughter of George Washington Morgan. Uh, he becomes a connoisseur and collector of art. He moves to Paris and dies there. But they bring him back and bury him at All Saints uh, Church in Tarsdale. But <clears throat> somebody else buys La Carolinita later, and that's Thomas Dolan. So he's a major textile manufacturer. That's his uh, factory there at the bottom. Also president of the, of the gas company, major business leader involved in all kinds of business and politics of Philadelphia. He's basically one of the wealthiest men in Philadelphia. Uh, he was renting another property in Tarsdale since the 1870s. He purchases La Carolinita in 1889, and he dies there in uh, 1914. Uh, the next property up is Rose Cottage, owned by George Carson. Um, this is a view of Rose Cottage. Again, these were right along the river, these uh, beautiful mansions. Um, and he was, I don't have a photo of him, someday I hope to find one, but he was also involved in the sugar trade. He marries another granddaughter of George Washington Morgan. He purchases the land from his mother-in-law and he builds Rose Cottage around 1850. He was known uh, for his beautiful gardens and arbors. Um, that was to the hallmark of his estate. And here's a photograph of the river gate between the Carson and Brown estates. Um, so <clears throat> here, G George Carson, which was Rose Cottage, that's right here, and the Nielsen Brown right here. Well, this gate we think is right here. So there's this river road, it's a pathway along the river. Remember, all these families are related. They're all, you know, cousins and whatever. So the, you know, they're moving back and forth and, you know, socializing with each other and everything. So this gate here uh, is just the gate between those two estates. And we come to the Nielsen Brown estate, uh, which is called Vancouver. Uh, you might have remembered, I mentioned in a map earlier, the Morgan family uh, built Vancouver in the 1840s, and then Nielsen Brown purchased and enlarged it in the 1870s. Uh, Nielsen Brown, uh, it's spelled Nielsen, it's pronounced Nelson. I should be pronouncing it Nelson. He's an heir to the Brown Brothers banking fortune. If you remember when we first looked at um, Tarsdale and Holmesburg, I said there's an estate of Alexander Brown right on 11 Mile Lane. Uh, that's his, that's Nelson Brown's father. So uh, his parents had this summer home and Tarsdale, and then he buys this uh, estate in the 70s and enlarges it. He marries a great granddaughter of George Morgan, and also who is the daughter of the Carsons next door at Rose Cottage. Um, and here is uh, Vancouver. And then in 1900, he has a home built for his daughter who married the son of Th Thomas Dolan, who lived a few doors down. Uh, and that's called Vancouver Lodge. It's designed by the noted Philadelphia architect, Wilson Iyer. And Nelson Brown was an avid uh, equestrian and uh, known for his tally-ho carriages horse. And he built this very elaborate stable 
which was most likely designed by the very famous uh, Philadelphia architect, Frank Furness. And this was something that my wife, Patty, discovered in a historical source. Uh, so this is a picture of the stable in 1876. My wife found a reference uh, in, a, in an unpublished history of Tarsdale that a local resident wrote in the early 20th century who said that Frank Furness designed this. Um, and this is it today, it's still there. Um, remember I said there were these two um, condominium developments, one of which is Baker's Bay. Well, the Nelson Brown stable is the Baker's Bay offices and clubhouse, just like Bakehouse 3, that modern building, is the clubhouse and headquarters for Del Air Landing, the other condominium community. Here's a picture of Nelson Brown uh, in front of the stable uh, on his carriage in 1893. Um, and then the next property up, well, actually, we're skipping a property, uh, uh, but Edwin Fittler's property, Luzon, uh, which was one of the grandest of all of these estates. Edwin Fittler uh, was a mayor of Philadelphia, and uh, he had a large cordage or rope works in Bridesburg. That's a picture of it. He was the mayor. He was also the president of the Union League, and um, this was his estate. Um, and then there's Fittler Street, of course, in Tarsdale, which is na which named after this estate or him. Um, and then um, we're going to talk for a minute about the Marlton Inn, which uh, was this uh, very elegant social center. Um, in this property map in 1876, this property right here uh, is owned by Edward Hopkins, who's the brother-in-law of Charles McAllister, the one who developed Tarsdale originally. Uh, and this is the Marlton Inn, uh, early 20th century view. And it's built on the foundation of that Risden's Hotel, that which goes back to the you know mid 1800s. Uh, so there was a hotel and resort here early on. So the Marlton Inn is just sort of built on the on the foundation of that and sort of continues that tradition. Um, so the, the there was a Mar the Marlton Inn had been there for quite a while, and then the Marlton Club was formed in 1898. And here's a uh, an article about that, um, and but they they were based at the Marlton Inn, which had been there for a while before that. But the Marlton Inn is this very fashionable resort. So remember, all these are wealthy landowners living right nearby. Also, just up the river, you know, the the Biddle family, and there's Drexels and Whartons up the river at Penryn, and so this whole area is like a concentration of very wealthy people. So this is the fashionable resort where they would all hang out. There was dining and dancing and people could boat and fish. There was a casino on the property, which not a casino in the current sense of gambling, but a casino as in the sense of an entertainment uh, center. There were beautiful landscape gardens. There were little vacation cottages you could rent. So this was, you know, where things were happening in Tarsdale. And uh, here's a 1920 property atlas. And you can see uh, there's the Marlton Inn, and it was owned by Edward Morrell, or actually he had died, but it was his estate. But Edward Morrell was like the mover and shaker of Tarsdale. He was a good friend of that Nelson Brown. He was a descendant of the Powell family. You might know the Powell House in downtown Philly. A stepson of John G. Johnson, who was an eminent lawyer. And you might know the John G. Johnson art collection, which is kind of the basis of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. So he comes from money, then he marries one of the Drexel sisters, marries into major money. He has all these elected and appointed uh, positions. Uh, he's a major landowner in Tarsdale, and he brings a telephone line, he brings electric to Tarsdale. Um, so he's just a real mover and shaker. And he married Louise Drexel, who was the one of the Drexel sisters. Uh, Louise's sister is Catherine Drexel, the, the Catholic saint. Um, they lived at this estate called San Jose, which is not on the river. It's, um, well, it's what's now Morrell Park off the river. 
Um, and this was the home that Thomas Dolan rented before he purchased La Carolinita. But this is where Edward Morrell and Louise Drexel Morrell lived. Uh, and then that, this whole property was demolished and developed into the neighborhood called Morrell Park. But back to the Morrell Inn, the Mar or some, sorry, the Marlton Inn, which Edward Morrell owned. He didn't manage it, but he owned it. Um, we don't know what happened to it after when it stopped being that resort, but went into some different hands. But here it comes onto the market in the 1940s, and it's purchased by Virginia Nower and her husband, Willem. Uh, she's a very prominent Republican you know, politician, uh, serves in national offices, uh, the first chief consumer advisor to Presidents Nixon and Ford and Reagan. She's the first person to hold that office. Here she is with Nixon. So. Um, she lived there at the Marlton Inn with her husband and her daughter. And here's a, an article talking about a, an estate called China Hall, which was further up in Bucks County, an 18th century estate that was getting demolished. And they took all the paneling, the, the Nowers, from China Hall and had it installed in the Marlton Inn. Uh, and this is them in their home. This is um, Virginia and her husband and their daughter. And the Marlton Inn is still there. It's now a private residence known as Marlton Manor. It's right on the river. And then that takes us to the last property we're going to look at, which is Glen Ford. Um, if you remember, uh, Charles McAllister built this property called Glen Gary around 1850. Uh, he dies and his daughter has it for a while. And then um, it's eventually acquired by Robert Forderer, who owns a large leather, leather works in Frankfurt. You know, we're talking about uh, Matthias Baldwin and, and um, Henry Diston. These guys were major industrialists. Well, Robert Forder was in that class, also a congressman. But he purchases Glengarry in 1895, and he takes the Glen from Glengarry and the Ford from Forderer, and he renames the estate Glen Ford. He undertakes a major renovation, but he dies before it's finished. And this is what it looks like. This is as renovated by uh, Robert Forder, and it's what it looks like today. Uh, his widow, on the far left there, the upper left, lived there until she died in 19, 1934. And then their daughter, Florence uh, Forder or Tonner, on the right, in the upper right, and then down on the lower right, lived there until her death in 1971. And, you know, Glen Ford was the epitome of the Gilded Age, you know, beautiful, and all these places that are no longer there that were its neighbors, these were Gilded Age mansions. And so there were elegant parties and, um, you know, social events. And this is a photo of one from Glen Ford. Now, what happens after Florence Tonnerer's death, according to her will, the property passed to the Lutheran Church of America, but there was a stipulation in the will that if the church couldn't use it or didn't want to use it, it would revert to the people of Philadelphia. So the church used it as a retreat center and a meeting space for a number of years, and then they wanted to sell it to a developer. And all the neighbors in, in that East Harsdale area organized and saved it from development, and the city acquired it and it becomes part of the Fairmount Park system. And this new Glen Ford Conservation Corporation was formed in 1988. And that the, the corporation manages Glen Ford in an agreement with the city. And it's this spectacular mansion and museum, and historic house. I um, heartily recommend that you go and see it. Um, uh, Florence Tonnerer was a major art collector, so there's an art gallery with some masterpieces, and uh, she had a phenomenal library. Here's some views. That skylight on the upper right there was recently restored. And of course, the grounds are spectacular, right where the Poquessing Creek uh, meets the um, Delaware River. So the grounds are a city park. You can go there and just walk around. You can also take tours of the, of the mansion. Um, so uh, Glen Ford is the last remaining Delaware River estate that is open to the public. And it's kind of an appropriate place to end our talk here. Um, this is where the Poquessing, that's the Poquessing Creek entering the Delaware River. That's Glen Ford, that, you know, white building right there. So it's right at the edge of the city. 
But one quick postscript, the whole area south, just below Glenford, so Glenford is, is here, this is where, when McAllister owned it, but this whole area going from the Bakehouse property all the way up to the Fittler property, that whole area was gonna be a city, was proposed as a city park. And um, it was this, you know, the forces of development versus the forces of, uh, you know, preserving as an open space and park. And so there were all the, you know, the local community tried to rally and there was some support for it to be a park, but eventually um, development, forces of development won out. And that's when the Baker's Bay and Delaware Landing uh, communities were built in the 1970s. So uh, unfortunately, all, now the estates themselves, most of them had, were long gone. They had been uh, abandoned and deteriorated. Many of them were destroyed by fire, some, some by arson. So all those estates were pretty much gone, uh, but the land was there uh, along the river. And what's left now in this whole, you know, concentration of Tarsdale, there's nothing left in all the estates we talked about below Tarsdale, you know, in Holmesburg and Taconi and and Frankfurt and Wissanoming. But in Tarsdale, there's a little cluster. Um, on the upper left, there's Glen Ford. On the upper right, there's the Marlton Manor. On the lower left, there's Bakehouse 3, built with stones from Bakehouse 2. And then uh, on the lower right, there's the uh, Nelson Brown Stable from 1876. But that's all that's left of all these magnificent estates along the river. And that sort of concludes our trip up the river from Frankfurt to Tarsdale. So um, we will now open it up to questions. Um, Patty, are you, uh, your microphone open now or? I believe it is, can you yes, hear me? I can hear you. Okay, yeah. uh, everyone is um, really complimenting you on a fascinating talk and excellent presentation. Uh, there aren't many questions, actually, though. Um, <laughs> I don't know whether Richard, that's good or bad. Yeah. Richard Iaconelli, and I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, he wants to know if Matthias Baldwin had anything to do with the Baldwin Piano no. Company. No. Completely yeah. different. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then um, Melissa... Kachowicz, I'm sorry, I'm saying your name wrong, I know. Wanted to know if uh, Matthias Baldwin had anything to do uh, with Baldwin Brass in Reading. No. Um, well, that I don't know. May, I don't know if maybe one of his sons or descendants went up there. Um, I mean, in the, there was a Baldwin uh, Brass in, outside of Exton in Chester County. Um, and I don't know if that's the same family that later moved to Reading. As far as I know, there's no relation, but I'm not 100% sure. Like maybe one of his, you know, descendants got into, you know, iron making brass and, and but I kind of don't think so. And Robert Bauman just said, don't forget Penn Wren. So, yeah, and you did mention that later on briefly. Yeah, again, uh, I mentioned the, well, again, the, the, this talk does not cover Bucks County. And I mentioned Andalusia and Devon, which are in that area right near Penn, next to Penn Rin. Um, and the reason I mentioned them is because they were uh, major banking families. And uh, that's what um, Charles McAllister was. Of course, actually, Penn Rin, I think they were Wharton and Drexel family. Uh, so they, that was a banking uh, family, partly, too. So maybe I should have included Penn Rin. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, and I just, Cynthia uh, Brennan. I, let me just jump in. So for those who don't know, uh, right next to Andalusia is this estate, Penn Rin. Uh, which, again, I think it was the Drexel and Morton families that had it for a while. Uh, and now it's a um, catering facility and, and, um, and, and uh, wedding type facility. Also a beautiful estate uh, right there on the river. Go ahead. Uh, 
Cynthia Brennan wants to know, are there any parts of the homes that are in the Philadelphia Museum of Art? I don't think so. Um, I mean, th as I said, the, uh, the, the Historical Society of Frankfurt has a few of those, you know, artifacts from those homes down there. Uh, but I don't know of any in the Museum of Art. Um, I mean, maybe some furniture that the family owned. Uh, and I've also heard that a, a lot of the art, art, artifacts and architecture of um, Chalkley Hall went to the Pennsylvania Museum in Harrisburg, the State Museum. But they don't display them, so I don't know for sure if they're there. But as far as I know, there's nothing of those homes in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, this is from Melissa again, who I really botched her last name, but uh, she loved hearing about all the properties and she wondered if any of your research extended to the old Penryn School in the Delaware River ma Mansion. She said what? her younger sister attended there and her mother was the bookkeeper. And I didn't realize there was even a school in there. Um, yeah, I remember when we toured it, there was um, part of the display talked about it was a school at one point. I really don't, I mean, we just talked about Penryn a minute ago. Um, yeah. I don't know its history that well. Again, I only focus on the Philadelphia side of things. So my knowledge of the Bucks County estates is very limited. But Penryn, uh, you know, we've, you and I, Patty, have toured that. And there are mm -hmm. displays and things. And I remember there was a time when it was a school. It sounds like it wasn't that long ago if this woman's mother was a bookkeeper there. Yeah. Um, someone wants to know if any of them were haunted. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. You know, maybe. I mean, they're all destroyed, you know, long ago. So who knows? Jeannie Green wants to know, do you know anything about uh, the mansion in Fox Chase at Ron and Veray, Knowlton Mansion? Yeah, well, again, that's not a riverfront estate. Um, uh, that also was designed by Frank Furness. Um, and it was the, um, the what, what were the families, the Greens and the Snodgrasses and I, um, I forget that that history, but uh, but you can tour. I mean, well, they, that's open for uh, you know events and catering events and weddings and whatnot. And then they have exhibits on the upper floors where you can learn that history of that house. Um, I forget the family name. I think the one guy didn't he invent um, ice cream? One of the soda? owners, yeah, one of the owners invented the ice cream soda. Right. Right. Yeah. And it was named after, and I the can't remember, name. were they the Varese? Was that the name of the original? Well, it was named yeah. after the, white, the wife's um, father. No, the Knoll yeah. family, which actually, if you saw in one of the maps in Tacony, I didn't talk about it, but there was a, a Knoll's mansion right near Magnolia. Um, and I think that's the same family that derived the Knowlton name from. Okay, and the um, Jeffrey Marshall just said that it was the Bickley Wharton Drexel family that owned um, Penn Wren. Right, and the Bickley family connects to the Tacconi uh, estate right. that we talked about, the Magnolia and all their, the, and then the Wharton Bickley, there was a guy, he changed his name, he was given a big chunk of the estate if he would change his name, I forget the um, the, the specifics of that story. But yeah, that's the same family that had the estates down in Tacconi, Bickley. Um, and Melissa, whose name that I keep um, saying wrong, it's Chikowitz, and uh, sh her sister attended the school at Penryn in the 70s. So oh. that's when there was a school there. Okay, yeah. And um, Lawrence Aragale would like to know if this is going to be posted on YouTube at a later date. I think we might do that. Yeah, I think there seems to be some interest in that. So, yeah, so everything uh, is on our Facebook page. 
um, you know, the Northeast Philadelphia History Network Facebook page. And then also, if you want to get on our email list, you can do that. And that's how you would get notices of all this, uh, all these things. So if we do, if and when we post this, that's where uh, notice will go out. And um, David Litovsky um, said that there is the forest home in Winfield. And that was also a home uh, with like activities. And that, that's well, where it had they, moved. Right. They moved in 1920. I didn't really talk about this, but it was 1926 or 27. They moved from Holmesburg to Winfield. And they were there for a number of years. And then they, then they moved to somewhere in New Jersey. And uh, I think they were taken over by another sort of health care provider or old folks home. And I don't think the name is anymore, but I think the forest home that moved out of Holmesburg is the one he's talking about that was in Winfield for a while. Mm -hmm. So other than a lot of compliments on the uh, great presentation and, you know, people having uh, memories of trick-or-treating at Mrs. Snodgrass's and she gave them cookies and things like that, you know, memories of people that lived in the areas. Um, that's all the questions for this evening. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, a reminder that Patty, who's been speaking, is going to give a talk in two weeks on the bridges on the Poquessing. We're going to send out a Zoom link for that meeting very soon, and it'll also be on our website, uh, on our Facebook page, and, and, and it'll go out in an email blast. So, um, and then we will be meeting Wednesday, first Wednesday of every month in some form or fashion, um, you know, and, until we can meet again in person. <laughs> but um, if you're interested in this kind of thing, please continue to patronize us. And um, Jeffrey Marshall would like to know, can you post your email website address again? Well, the, the uh, yeah, let me, um, I, well, that's back at the very beginning of my presentation. Um, or should I just hit control home, right? Yeah. No, it's not going to work in that. Um, in the full screen, I can't just uh, skip home. So I'm coming to the first, um, very first slide in the presentation where the, okay, all right, there it is. Um, anyphillyhistory at gmail.com. And if you uh, send an email to that address saying that you wanna get on our email list, uh, then you'll be added to the list. And then the other thing is to just go on Facebook for the Northeast Philly uh, History Network Facebook page. And um, before signing off, I would just like to suggest, uh, I had given the first part of the bridges uh, across the Pequesting back before the um, pandemic hit us and we can't meet in person. So uh, to give you a full, the full story, if you want to go on our Facebook page, the link to the presentation um, is on YouTube and you, you know, you can see it there and uh, sometime before the 7th of October, watch the first part and then we'll pick up where we left off on that date. Any other questions before we sign out? Well, okay, everybody. Thanks for tuning in um, and stay in touch. Stay healthy. Stay safe. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye-bye.